that we've had time to fellowship with our families today for all those that have had safe journey passage back to us for all the answered prayer that's evident among us this evening we're thankful that our young folks have had this opportunity to participate in the last leaders event we're so thankful for Sean and Mickey and all the other parents that were instrumental and involved in trying to orchestrate this event and get our young folks prepared. May they continue in their zeal and may each one that participated get something from it, get edification of it and derive benefit from it. But most importantly, that you may be glorified as a result. For every effort that this congregation is preparing for to edify this area and especially those of this number we ask for success for the singing that's coming up at Lithia Springs may it be well attended for the other area singings that will be happening this spring and the gospel meeting that's upcoming that we will have we ask that much good come from it that we would begin even now to prepare our hearts and minds and invite as many folks as we come across to come and be a part of that effort so you may be glorified as a result be with Brother Martin as he continues our song service tonight. May it be edifying and uplifting to us. And Brother Sidney, as he brings us another message from my word, we're thankful for his dedication, for his knowledge, for his ability. We ask that our hearts will be receptive to what he has to speak to us about. May it be the most needful thing for us at this time. We're mindful of these that we mentioned several this morning that desire part in our prayer. Those that are not doing well. We ask that you watch over and keep each one. We know that they desire to improve, and we would ask that you look down upon them and help them in that effort for those that tend to their needs. May they be successful and help us to have an encouraging word, a kind deed, to help them along the way. For anyone else of our number or those that are family members of our number that are hurting in any way, may we try to help them and let them know that we genuinely care for them and their well-being and for their soul. Continue to watch after us and care for us as we strive to do what's right on a daily basis. Forgive us when we stumble and fall. And again, for each effort that every person of this congregation tries to do and what's right, hold us up, lift us up, and edify us in those efforts. Continue to watch after us and be with us through the remainder of this service and whatever future life you see best for us. For this is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 156. 156. Only in the old Savior mind Well, my soul in this divine Is that a world of all combined Never can take from me
Number 195. We'll sing this as an invitation hymn after the lesson this evening. 195. Stand and turn number 525. 525. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land, glory land way. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. Turning in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 22. 2 Kings chapter 22. Uh, last week I began study of some things that are revealed to us in this chapter. And I actually got through only one of about five or six points that I intended to cover. So I'm going to try to give you the rest of it tonight. It was a very dim time in the history of the nation of Israel. Through the process of time, of course, a lot of things had changed in their spirituality. As a result of living in a land with those who were serving idols, various gods, Israel had been so influenced by them that according to the writings of Isaiah, they had reached a point where they would call good evil and evil good. They didn't seem to know the difference between good and evil. If you'll recall, when God was planning to take them into that promised land, He instructed them to drive out the inhabitants thereof, lest they affect you spiritually. They didn't do that. And they continue to have association with the idolatrous worshipers of that land. And they began to serve gods. As a matter of fact, we're told in the record relative to Solomon that he built various altars to the gods of the various wives that he had married in the land. That's how far they had left the truth. Somewhere along the way, the book of the law had been lost. Josiah is now king over Israel. This begins in chapter 22 of 2 Kings. He begins to reign, and of course in the process, the house of the Lord was being what we would call today renovated. 
It had been destroyed, parts of it had been unkept, and so under the leadership of King Josiah, it was being renovated. And in a process of time, there was a book that was found, later discovered, to be the book of the law of the God of Israel. We looked at some of these things last week in the early part of chapter 22. Then you come down to verse 10, you'll find that the uh, book was read, Shaphan read it before the king. And obviously at that point, King Josiah recognized it for what it was. Now in our study last week, and we mentioned a lot of background material leading up to this point, and we emphasize the necessity of the reading of the Word of God, even in our day and time. And the fact that uh, the book of the law of God was lost back then would suggest to us that it can be lost just as well today. It doesn't have to be lost in the rubble. It doesn't have to be lost as the result of, of your house or mine being destroyed. But it can be lost from our hearts and our lives simply because we do not continue to read it and to study it and to apply it in our own lives. And whatever at whatever point, the law of the law of the Lord is lost in our hearts and in our lives. We need to find that book. We need to begin to read it again and study it again. There is no other way. For us to know the will of God, except by reading the book wherein God has revealed His mind to us. In writing to the church at Corinth, Paul emphasized, and he raised the question, What man knoweth the mind of a man, save the spirit of man that is within him? Who is it that knows what you're thinking at this point, now we have people who say, oh, I can read your mind. I hope you can. But who knows what's in your mind right now? Nobody else is going to know. But when you reveal through words what's in your mind, then anybody who hears those words will know what you're thinking. Paul says in the same way, who knows the mind of God save the Spirit of God? And then he goes on to talk about the fact that the Spirit of God has revealed in words, not words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And so the Spirit of God has revealed to these writers the mind of God, and when we read this book, we can know as well the mind of God, at least concerning the things that He has revealed to us in this book. Now, there's still some things we don't know. Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, simply said that there are some secret things that belong to God. and We have to leave those there. Oftentimes, questions arise of a biblical nature to which there is no specific biblical answer. God just does not answer every question that man might come up with relative to this book. I don't know of any man that can answer any question that can be raised about this book. But we can know the mind of God on what has been revealed by reading and studying what He has said. So in our study last week, we emphasized that point, that we need to no longer neglect the Word of God, but read it and study it. Paul said in Romans 15, 4, Whatsoever things were written aforetime, specifically referencing the Old Testament, were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. We can learn some things from the Old Testament. We can learn how God dealt with those people who were obedient. We can learn how God dealt with those who were disobedient. We can learn from the, the writings of the Old Testament that God expects us to respond in a certain way to what He has said and what we can expect from God if we do not respond in that way. 
So in verse 10, and that's where we basically spent our time last week, and Shaphan read it before the king. But if you continue reading, and we read several of these verses in our study last week, but in verses 11, 12, and 13, but I want you to notice specifically verse 13, in which uh, uh, the statement was made in closing out uh, uh, the latter part of verse 12, Shaphan the scribe and Asahiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me for the people and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book, to do according unto all which is written concerning us. It is evident from this verse, and especially verses 11, 12, and 13, that not only when the book was found was it read, but it is evident as well that Josiah received the word of the book. You know, it's one thing to read God's word, and it's another thing to receive it. There are a lot of people who read it, but never receive it. That's always been the case. You'll recall in several references, for example, and we mentioned this in a recent study in Acts chapter 2. We often talk about what a great day that was. First Pentecost, after the resurrection of Christ, Peter standing up with the eleven spoke and for the first time preached the reality of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That had been preached in prophecy many times prior to that occasion, but never as a reality. As a result of Peter standing up with the eleven, accusing those present of crucifying the Son of God, when they heard this, they were pricked in the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter told them what to do, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, and there were about 3,000 souls that day who received the Word of God. When they heard that, they gladly received the Word and did what they were told to do. But at the same time, there were several thousand more in Jerusalem on that same occasion who heard the same word, but who did not receive it. That is, they didn't hear it to the point of obedience. There are a lot of people like that today. There are a lot of folks who hear, there are a lot of folks who read, but simply never receive, that is, in obedience to the word of God. You'll recall in Acts chapter 7, the occasion of the stoning of Stephen. He was speaking to a group of rebellious Jews and he said uh, well he goes all the way back to, to Abraham actually beginning in the early part of chapter 7 and he gives them a brief survey of the rebellious nature of the people of Israel beginning with Abraham leading right on up to them and then he said you are just like your fathers in other words they were rebellious so are you they didn't receive the word so well, did they? They heard it, but they didn't receive it. And as a result of their unwillingness to receive the word of God, Stephen was stoned. In Acts chapter 17, Paul in Athens saw a city wholly given to idolatry. He spoke unto them, he saw this inscription to the unknown God. He said, Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Great lesson on God in Acts 17. You ought to go back and read it. Several points that he makes about God, beginning with God the Creator, leading all the way up to God the source of judgment. Several points in between there. But when he got through with that lesson on God, there were certain people who claved to him. That is, they heard what he had said with regard to God. But there were others who were rebellious and did not receive the word. 
the thing that is encouraging about Josiah in this regard, and that's the desired result is that not only will people read the Word of God, but they will receive it as well. So there's a point of commendation with regard to King Josiah. He had the book read, and then he received what he had heard. But then you'll notice back up in verse 11 of 2 Kings 22, And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes. That is one thing that you will find repeatedly mentioned through the Old Testament especially, which was a sign or a show of repentance. They would repent, oftentimes in sackcloth and ashes. And involved in that was the renting of their clothes. Because of the, the outrage of sadness in learning of their obedience to the will of God. So Josiah, when he received the word, repented of the negligence of those of his people. He goes on to say, as we noted in verse 13, the great, a great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us. Because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book. He knew how God felt about it. And you see, we can learn that same lesson tonight, can't we? We need to read God's word. We need to receive God's word. And whenever there is a discrepancy between the life that we're living and that which God expects of us, there needs to be repentance on our part. We need to turn away. Repentance is really nothing but a change of mind that results in a change of action. So if we're living in sin, God would call upon us to repent. That's the same message that we have today. Those people on Pentecost... When they raised the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? What did Peter say? The first thing he said was, repent. He just accused them of crucifying the Son of God. There's got to be a change of mind about that that will result in a change of action. Rather than crucifying the Son of God, you must become obedient to the Son of God. Change of mind that results in a change of action. And they did that. In Luke chapter 13, in verses 3 and 5, verse 5 is actually repetitious to what is said in verse 3. In which Luke records, I tell you nay, that except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Perhaps that's one of the most difficult things for us to cause people to do today. And that is repent of their sins. It's difficult in some cases to get people just to listen to the Word. But then to get them to receive that Word and to recognize that they are not what they ought to be, to get them to acknowledge that our life is not in harmony with the will of God, therefore I've got to make some changes, is difficult. You'll recall in um, Matthew's account of the Great Commission, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Mark's account says, go, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But when you come to Luke's account, Luke says that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now that's where it began. Acts 2 is in Jerusalem. Peter preached repentance beginning in Jerusalem. But it's the same message that needs to be preached tonight. When people find themselves out of harmony, and that's exactly what Josiah says here, our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book. Hopefully tonight, that could not be said of us that we've not hearkened under the words of this book. But if it is in fact the case 
that that could be said of me, then the very thing that I need to be willing to do is to repent. That is exactly what's taking place here in verse 11. You'll recall I mentioned a moment ago, Acts 17, when Paul was in Athens. One of the things that he spoke relative to God, relative to his lesson on God, was the judgment. And involved in that lesson, he said in the times of this ignorance, God winked at. But now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because He hath appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness. By that man whom He hath ordained, whom He raised from the dead. That's Jesus. He's going to be the judge. God's the source of it. Jesus is the one who's actually going to preside at the judgment, if you please. Based upon that and because of that, He calls upon all men everywhere to repent. But instead of that, there are many people who harden their hearts. In the book of Hebrews chapter 3, three or four verses in that chapter I want you to notice with me. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 8. The Hebrews writer writing to Jewish converts People who had come out from under the law of Moses were now obedient to the will of Christ. They obviously are children of God at this point, but there's, in their case, as well as in the case of a lot of others, there was the temptation to, to turn away, to turn back to their former way of life, to leave the Word of God. And so he encourages them in that regard. You'll notice in chapter 2, he says in verse 1, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. So don't let them slip. We've got to hold on to the Word of God. So in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 8, he says, Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now notice to whom he's writing here. He's writing to brethren, those who are now children in the family of God. And he said you need to take heed lest you depart from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. Now look at this. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Now notice again verse 15. While it is said today, if ye will hear His voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. That goes back to the wilderness again. So three times. In this short section, the Hebrews writer says to brethren, don't let your hearts become hardened. Don't turn away from serving the living God. And so, in that regard, we need to be careful, don't we? Paul, in writing to Timothy on another occasion, talked about those whose hearts have become seared with a hot iron. Past feeling. The Word of God no longer penetrates their hearts and their minds. They don't want to hear it. Have you ever talked to anybody like that? Try to study with them. Try to let them know what God wants them to do in order to become children of God and live faithfully as children of God. And they'll basically tell you, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. 
Their hearts will become hardened. We ought always to have a soft heart when it comes to the Word of God. So that's the warning here to these people. So, so Josiah, when the book was found, the book was read, he received it, he repented of the negligence of his people on that occasion. Then you'll notice coming over into chapter 23, and the king sent, and they gathered in him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, all the inhabitants of, Israel, of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. Another interesting observation from this text. The book of the law, when it was found, was read. It was received. Josiah repented of the ways of his people. And then he realized that others needed to hear what was in this book of the law of God as well. Wasn't something that Josiah could keep for himself. Now you might recall, in our background study last week, we mentioned that, that one of the commands that actually... Moses gave to that second generation of Israel as recorded in the book of Deuteronomy, when you get into that land, looking forward to this time, when you get into that land and you request a king, that's what they did, wasn't it? Give us a king like the nations around us. When I give you a king, God said, I want the king to make a copy of the book of the law for himself. King needs a book of the law, doesn't he? If he's going to be ruler over God's people, then he needs to know what the book of the law for those people has to say to them. So the king needs a copy. You'll recall as well that, that there was to be a copy of the book of the law kept in the side of the Ark of the Covenant. And so there were opportunities for the people to have access to the book of the law. Should not have been lost. Says something about the king. He didn't obviously didn't keep up with his copy. Not Josiah, but one before him. Others had not kept copies of it. But now that it's been found, Josiah is not sitting back and saying, Well, I've got my copy. I'm the king, and I've got my copy, so I'm not worried about anybody else. No, no, no. He realized that others needed to hear what was in that book. How would they know what to do if they did not hear what was in that book? So you go back to those accounts of the Great Commission that I mentioned a moment ago. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's what God expects of us today. Those who are members of the family of God. Those who are of the household of faith. Our responsibility is to see that the world hears the Word of God. The church, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, is the pillar, and I often emphasize that's P-I-L-L-A-R, not P-I-L-L-O-W. The church is the pillar and the ground, the very support of the truth. If the church of the Lord does not uphold the truth, then nobody else is going to do that. So we have that responsibility. Mark's account says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke says, the repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Jesus, in giving instruction to the disciples, said that it will begin in Jerusalem, then to Judea, then to Samaria, then to the uttermost parts of the earth. The gospel was to be carried. Would tonight that we could realize, as King Josiah did here, that other people need to know the Word of God. God's desire is, according to Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, God's desire is that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. <clears throat> you know, one of the most disturbing things 
that men have ever taught, contrary to the Word of God, is that God never intended for all men to be saved. That's the most outrageous doctrine that men could ever come up with. He would have all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Why go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature if God doesn't want every creature to be saved? But there's that responsibility that we have in that regard. Josiah recognized that. We need to recognize that. And then beginning in chapter 23 and verse 4, and I'll not take the time, the time tonight to read it all, but, but really beginning in verse 4, and going all the way down through verse 24 of chapter 23. The basic thing that you'll find in that particular section of Scripture is that when Josiah had, had the word read, he had received it. He had repented of the ways of his father, of his fathers. He has now realized that everybody needs to hear that word taught. In addition to that, Josiah rejected every false way. Every one of them. Just began reading. Verse 4, the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for all the host of heaven and he burned them without to Jerusalem in the fields of, of Kadron and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. He put down the idolaters' priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained. Whoa, what did that say? He put down the idolaters' priests that the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense. And in the- that, that tells you how far they had gone, doesn't it? Now you just keep on reading down through there. Then you come down to um, <clears throat> verse 15. I find this to be an interesting point. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel. Does that ring a bell if you didn't read any further? What happened at Dan and Bethel? Well, whenever the nation of Israel was divided, Israel to the north, Judah to the south, Jeroboam became ruler of the north. Rather than to allow the people under his domain to go back to Jerusalem where God had ordered worship to take place, he built altars and places of worship at Dan and Bethel, one in the north, one in the south of his kingdom. And he didn't have authority from God to do that either. So now Josiah comes along. The altar that was at Bethel And the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, had made Israel to sin. You see, when Jeroboam built these altars, these places of worship, for the nation of Israel, the northern ten tribes to worship, rather than allowing them and encouraging them to go to Jerusalem, where God said they were worshipped, caused those people to sin. It wasn't acceptable. So, both that altar and the high place he broke down and burned the high place and uh, stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar and polluted it. According to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, he proclaimed these words. So right on down through there. That shows the extent to which Josiah was going in order to completely rid the land of any influence of idolatry. Every false way. We need to be concerned tonight about truth. And we need to hold the truth against every false way. You know, Peter talked about those who would deny that there's a resurrection. 
Where is the prom- or rather, uh, second coming of Christ? Where is the promise of His coming, they said. There were those Sadducees who rejected the idea of the resurrection. Peter talked about those on another occasion who would be false prophets, false teachers, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. So we need to know what the truth is, don't we? Where do we find the truth? We find it in God's Word. We don't find it in the books of men. We don't find it in what I think, what you think. We find the truth in God's Word. In John 17, 17, Jesus in His prayer to the Father said, But sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy Word is truth. That's why it's important for us to find the book of the law today. To read it. To reject every false way. And that's what He did. In Psalm 119 and verse 104, The psalmist said, through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. You see, the problem with Israel was they compromised with the people in whose land they were dwelling. They compromised. Some of you may recall back when we studied through the life of Abraham. When was that? Fifteen years? No, I haven't been here that long. Seems like almost that long ago. We studied through the life of Abraham. And when Abraham got into the land that God said, I'll show you, the first thing he did when he got there was built an altar to worship God. Why did he do that? There were already bunches of altars there. Well, there were altars to all kinds of gods already there. Why did he just compromise his faith and worship with one of them? Because Abraham knew better. You can't compromise the truth with error. Or you'll bring the wrath of God upon you. So he destroyed the heathen idols. He restored worship to God. Then you look in chapter 23 and in verse 25. After all that you find about Josiah in this section. And like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him. None before him, none after him. That's interesting in view of the fact that David was said to be a man after God's own heart. And yet according to this statement, Even David, in that consideration, did not turn to the Lord as did Josiah. Says a lot about this man, doesn't it? Then when you go back to chapter 22 briefly, verses 16 through 20, you'll find the result of what Josiah has done. And I want you to notice, especially in verse 19, Because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou heardest what I spake against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me, I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace. Thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. God says, Josiah, you've heard me, and now I've heard you. As a result of that, you can go to your grave. In peace. He's tender hearted, has an humble heart, has an obedient heart. And he went to his grave in peace. You know, tonight we can do the same thing. 
if we will have that tenderness of heart that we will receive the word of God, if we will have that humility of heart <clears throat> that we will submit ourselves to the will of God, we'll have that obedient heart that we'll do whatever it is that God calls upon us to do. Having done that, we can go to our graves in peace. What a comforting thought that is. And what great lessons we can learn from King Josiah when the book of the law was found. What about the book of the law of the Lord tonight as far as you're concerned? Do you have a tender heart in receiving it, in hearing it, in turning away from those things in your life that are amiss and being obedient to the word of the Lord? That's the only way you can go to your grave in peace. That is, at peace with God. Now, you might go to your grave thinking you're at peace with yourself and with God. You know, the proverb writer said in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, there's a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. When we follow this book, folks, we know we're right. You don't have to guess about it. You don't have to say, well, I think this and I think... You can know. John said in 1 John... These things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. But if we don't read the book and we don't receive the book and we don't become obedient to the book, then we cannot expect that peace that Josiah was promised. Tonight, if you're not a child of God, you need to turn away from a life of sin. There are only two places to be. Either child of God or child of the devil. There's no neutral ground on which you can stand. You're either going down that narrow way that leads to life or you're going down the broad way that leads to destruction. You need to be sure you're on the right way. Faith in Jesus Christ that would lead you to turn from sin and confess that faith. That would cause you to be buried with your Lord in baptism. You can be raised to walk in newness of life. And you can find that in Romans 6 verses 3 and 4. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. As a child of God, you know, again, we note what the writer of Hebrews said, encouraging those brethren, take heed to yourselves, lest you depart from the living God. Is it possible tonight that you're a child of God, but you've departed from the living God? Don't let your heart become so hardened that the word of God will never have effect on your life. But have a tender heart, a receptive heart, an obedient heart to the Word of God. Come back home asking God's forgiveness. And if we can assist you in that, we'd be delighted to do it. So we stand together and sing this song of invitation. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, for you.
Our thanks to Brother Sidney for those fine lessons today. For all others that are public part in our worship, for those that are visiting, we're certainly glad that you decided to be here with us. Please take a moment, fill out an attendance card, leave that on the table as you depart so that we may have a record of your visit here with us. I remind you again of those on our prayer list from this morning. Brother Richard Wheeler has been able to come home from the hospital. We're glad to report. Marshall Flowers continues at the hospital in Gunnersville, Alabama. We hope that he's getting some better, but very slowly. So your prayer is requested on his behalf. You're also asked to remember the Woody family. Greg's father specifically has more surgery upcoming April the 4th, as uh, Gail is also having some tests upcoming. Louise Morris, we're glad to report, is now at home. She is weak. She is in a wheelchair at this time, but she is at home from the hospital. J.W. Gray has also been able to go home, but he is recovering there. Mildred Gray also is now back at home. And again, the church has received a thank you card from Ken Glover's brother, Dick Glover, that will be on the bulletin board here in this hallway if you would like to review it. Again, this Friday is the area-wide singing at the Lithia Springs Congregation. It begins at 7 o'clock. We're all invited to attend, and the van will go. It will depart 6 p.m. sharp on Friday evening, March the 28th. So if you'd like to either ride on the van or get us a great big convoy to go over there, we can certainly do that. But that will be this coming Friday, March the 28th, the singing at Lithia Springs. Also, for those members of this congregation that don't live in the city limits of Bremen, if you'd like to have a copy of the most recent House to House and Heart to Heart, it is on the table in the foyer. Also, the most recent edition of the Think magazine, if some of you have a, an occasion to read this, you would certainly be well suited to do so. There are several out there on the table, but it's first come, first serve. Once they run out, we don't have any more. But that is the March 08 edition of the Think Magazine. More, much more detail about one of the co-editors of this will be uh, conducting a seminar for us this fall, Brother Jim Palmer, but he is one of the co-editors of this magazine, and it's certainly well worth your time if you would like to review it. The Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those that wish to observe it. Once we stand and sing, go through this door, second door on the right, and down the hall, you will be served at that time. The next service we have will be Wednesday at 7 p.m., and we hope to see each of you at that time. Should we mention anything else? Final song. 429. 429. I think I see it right here. 429 is our final song. If you'll stand, we'll sing and be dismissed. <coughs> this opportunity we've had this evening to come here and worship thee and song and praises and set another portion of thy word. We ask that we take this word which taught to us tonight and apply it to our lives to help strengthen our lives that we might be a better example for others around about us. We also ask for those that were mentioned that were unable to be here due to the sickness, ask the comfort and care for their needs, and also for those that are having some tests done that things will go well with them. I ask you to forgive us over many sins and guide, guard, and direct us as we depart from here. Bring us back in the next appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.